1940, the United States was rebuilding the economy after the devastating effects of the Great Depression from 1929 to 1939. President Franklin Roosevelt passed the New Deal, focusing on relief, recovery, and reform. However, Germany was outraged by the outcome of the Great War. Adolf Hitler was forming the Nazi Party and made himself absolute leader in 1934. He was a firm believer in racial superiority, and in 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were enacted, denying civil rights to Jews. The United States was determined to stay out of the conflict and believed that involvement in European affairs would be a reflection of the Great War. 85% of the American people believed that they should not get involved unless directly attacked. I know it was all excited because here was all the talk about the war, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And so, of course, we were doing this video from then on the rest of the evening. Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate, of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States declared war on Japan December 8, 1941. I interviewed James Pa, who enlisted in the Navy in June of 1945. He grew up in Montana and worked on a farm throughout the Great Depression. He spent two months in a boot camp at Great Lakes Naval Base for radio technician training. He was in high school when the war began and remembers the rations implemented to help support the war effort and prevent inflation. The Office of Price Administration oversaw the price controls. The goal was to increase the federal budget in order to have more money to put into the war. Every six months or something, you'd go in and get a new ration card for the next six months, and there would be a stamp on there, and you could take it in and buy uh, four gallons of gas, and pay for the gas, and you'd take it one part, one stamp, and then there was a sugar ration, and so soap so was very short. Uh, so and a lot of farm people who would make soap. My mother used to make soap. She collect lard. And I used grease and mixed it with lye and make soap. Worked just fine for washing clothes. You couldn't use it for washing your hands. Oh, it wars are. It was kind of. A, in 1940, all men between the ages of 21 to 45 were required to register for the draft. It was the first peacetime draft in U.S. history. If selected, you had to serve at least one year in the armed forces. And everybody, all the kids were talking about, join up, even in high school. By the end of the war, 50 million had registered and 10 million were drafted. Boot camp provided men with uniforms, shoes, toothbrushes, and other personal care products. The men knew they would be provided with all necessary materials and brought very little to the camp. The boot camp also provided men with vaccinations. Boot camp essentially was where you learn some of the big military and military users, and you learn uh, how to take care of yourself. And getting shots was an interesting thing. When, uh, when you they lined up in the margin of the state, big bears, drill ball, they called them. Uh, some of these young fellows who were giving shots just couldn't do it the way they were supposed to do it. They, they were playing games and they'd take the, they'd the needle with the, the, the syringe and the needle and they'd throw that shit, throw it into your arm. And sweet. At the end of the boot camp, an exam called the Eddy test was administered to the men. If you passed the Eddy test, it qualified you to join the Electronic Training Program, a highly acclaimed technical program in the armed forces. The war got over about a month after I was in, and so that program kind of quit, pretty much quit. So then I, they sent me back to Great Lakes Naval Training Station and sent me to the Sunkeeper School. And there I learned how to actually handle the records, financial records. World War II officially ended in August of 1945, 
when Japan surrendered after the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Or they're not bloody, they didn't die, they had a barrel, people just bothered people's minds for a long time afterwards from the time, uh, and discharged people's lives tremendously. But it was as good as could be done. I would, I, you know, it was a pretty hard to make any statement about how the world happened. The attack on Hiroshima resulted in 135,000 casualties and around 69,000 people lost their lives. But I did realize that at the time I had spent uh, a year there that I really wasn't fitted for military life. I, I just, I kind of have an independent streak, a negative streak. When somebody tells me this is what I gotta do, I have a natural tendency to say, uh, why should I do that? Or, I don't really it's just, a, it's just my name that I have to do about it. Even though he only spent a short period of time in the armed forces, his experiences changed his attitude and outlook on what it is to be American. He formed a stronger bond with the country and felt a connection with the nation as a whole. The only thing I do have is I have, a, I guess, a little different uh, attitude towards patriotism and people that did not serve go to service. In 2014, we take items such as soap, sugar, and gasoline for granted. With our lavish technologies designed to simplify, it would be devastating to experience a ration like what my grandpa explained. I don't want you to sit down with your mother and father or somebody and figure out where you could go if you got four gallons of gas. How much, how much it would change your life if you could use four gallons of gas? The message I got from the interview was to not be afraid to try something, even though it might not work out, and appreciate the country we live in and the people who serve it.